Among the excellent cast was Russian baritone Anatoly Lochak. Here he is as the pompous courtier Potemkin singing the praises of the Tsarina. <laughs> Anatoly Lochak and the chorus in Tchaikovsky's Chervichki. Bakula the Smith loves Oksana, but she won't marry him unless she can have a pair of slippers like those of the Tsarina, the Chervichki of the title. Thanks to the machinations of a friendly devil, he is magically flown to St. Petersburg and meets the Tsarina, who gives him a pair of her Chervichki, and he then wins Oksana's hand back home. Here's the closing bar to the opera, with the tenor Roman Zimbla as Vakula presenting the Chervichki to Oksana sung by Marina Levitt. She tells him she'd accept him even without them, after all. Her father, sung by the Russian bass Vladimir Matorin, tells her she made a wise choice as the opera ends with cheers all round. <laughs> Amen. 
Closing bars of Tchaikovsky's Cherviki at the 1993 festival conducted by Alexander Anisimov. Elaine Padmore was to serve one more year before departing for the Royal Opera in Copenhagen. More recently, she has taken over as head of opera at Covent Garden. Her last season included Leon Cavallo's La Boheme, Wagner's Das Liebesverbot, based on Shakespeare's Measure for Measure, and Anton Rubinstein's colourful Russian opera, The Demon. This was to be the first of four Wexford Festival operas to appear on the Marco Polo label. Anatoly Lochak returned to take the title role, with Alison Browner as the angel, opposing his attempts to corrupt the beautiful Tamara. Here they are in the prologue, as the demon curses the world and the angel resists him.
Alison Browner and Anatoly Lochak in Rubinstein's The Demon, conducted by Alexander Anisimov. Elaine Padmore was succeeded by the director of the Rossini Festival in Pesaro, Luigi Ferrari, who was more recently appointed director of the prestigious Bologna Opera. This brought a further change of style and direction, introducing a strong emphasis on the Italian and late Romantic operas. In his first year, he brought three interesting and contrasting pieces, Pacini's Sappho, Mascagni's Iris, and Rimsky-Korsakov opera, May Night. Puccini's opera dates from 1840 and tells an imaginary version of the death of Sappho, the Greek poet from Lesbos. Thwarted in love, she has desecrated the altar in the temple and now must die. With a final farewell to the man she has loved in vain, she leaps to her death from the sacrificial rock into the sea. Francesca Padacci sings the title role. RTE Radio 1, Bowman, Saturday, 8.30. Introduced, presented by, I beg your pardon, presented by John Bowman. Good morning and welcome to this week's programme. A special edition on the late Dr. Tom Walsh to mark the 50th anniversary of the Wexford Festival Opera. The festival founder and first artistic director, Tom Walsh, on the magic of opera when he first heard it in Wexford as an 11-year-old boy how the festival began 50 years ago. And friends and colleagues talk about how one man's passion created what the Financial Times has called one of the world's most remarkable festivals. Dr. Tom Walsh, with friends including Des French and Eugene McCarthy, founded the Wexford Festival just 50 years ago. He was a medical doctor and an aesthetist, and he continued as the director of the Wexford Festival until 1966 by when it had so flourished that it needed a full-time professional artistic director. It has become world famous, and this year's festival programme, just announced, will run from the 18th of October to November the 4th. 
we mark the 50th anniversary this morning with a tribute programme to Tom Walsh. Um, I'm not going to keep you any longer now from uh, Mr. Compton Mackenzie and once more I wish to congratulate everyone concerned for a splendid performance. Erskine Childers, later fourth president of Ireland at the first Wexford Festival. Well, uh, Mr. Minister, Mr. Chairman, Reverend Fathers, Ladies and gentlemen, well, it's been a really grand evening. I think that, first of all, we must admit. And the, 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 the man who's... Um, here he is. Look at him. <laughs> Sir Compton Mackenzie at the opening of the Wexford Opera Festival in 1951, paying his tribute to Tom Walsh. And here in another archive interview from that year is Tom Walsh and talking about the beginnings of the Wexford Opera Festival. Last... November, we tried to form an opera study circle here. And my good friend, Mr. Compton Mackenzie, came and gave us an inaugural address. Well, the opera st circle has gone on quite well since, but it is really just a means to an artistic end. But what we have in mind is the formation of a musical festival, which we hope, it's very much in the air at the moment, but we hope that by next, say, October or November, that for some four or five days we will have a musical festival running here in the town. Another archive interview recorded in 1980, Tom Walsh discussed his boyhood in Wexford and how dull it all had been. I was born and lived, I've lived all my life in Wexford. And Wexford, when I was very young, was a very dull country town. And one of the reasons why I loved going to the theatre because opera came from the theatre to me, but why I loved going to the theatre was that there was light there. Now, you see, if you take, if you take a town like Wexford when I was young, one had gas in, say, the first two floors. You lived, as I still live, in a three-storey house. You had gas on the first two floors, which wasn't very bright anyway, but one went to bed with a candle or a lamp. And when the electricity goes nowadays and I have to try and read or write with a lamp or candle, I... I don't know how it was possible that anybody could survive, but that is not right. You went to the theatre and there was a, what seemed to be a blaze of light and it was coloured light. Then I remember my first opera that I saw, a little, a little touring companies then used Come to Wexford. And I remember my first opera that I saw, it was Rigoletto. And I simply fell in love with opera, with the excitement of it, with the... The music, you see, added so much to the spoken dialogue. And I was quite young then, I was only about 11. But from that on, I simply just took to opera and have been at it ever since in one form or other. In Ortiz's archives, there are a number of interviews with Tom Walsh. In this recording, he recalls the style of production he remembers when he first saw touring opera companies on the stage in Wexford as a boy. You, you, got, quite, you got quite an impression of opera here because the theatre was so small, it was all so intimate, and because you had no standards to go by, and, and also because there's no such thing as, even where there's no television, no mm. radio. Mm. You had some gramophone records, perhaps, but this at least was something live and something immediate and something that you could catch on to. How often would companies like this uh, come? They'd come at least once a year, and possibly occasionally twice a year, but usually once a year for about a week. And it always starts with something like a maritime, something simple, and then work into the um, trovatories and the regulators and things like that. And always end, end again with something uh, popular like the Bohemian Girl on the last night. And of course, again, then the, 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 the audience were, audiences were very unsophisticated, including myself and that. And 
one knew all the ballad airs and all the airs from these popular operas. See, it's a funny thing that possibly I never saw a comic opera until I went to Dublin or London many years after. The intriguing thing is that they only produced the dramatic operas like Faust, Trovatore, Rigoletto, Traviata. And I often wonder what the reason for that was. Because they're producing what the public liked and what the public wanted. Anna McMaster used to talk about that as well yes. when he toured with yes. Shakespeare that it was the great tragedies that the, yes. the plain that people of true. Ireland yes. seemed to like. Yes. Oh, I remember Mac yes. Weld yes. playing here. Yes. So, but that is true that they didn't. They, 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 there was no evidently no audience for, for comic operas. Tom Walsh's sister, Nellie Walsh, recalled in a tribute programme after his death the brother she remembered when they were growing up in Wexford in the 1920s. Theirs was a musical household, a piano, a gramophone with some records, and the early acquisition of a primitive radio. I was able, apparently, to play well enough to keep a Sunday afternoon. We used to be at the piano ourselves, the two of us. And uh, we didn't see any reason to do anything else. I think we've been always a bit mixed up with music, that it filled up an awful lot. We were there in the beginning of, you must remember, radio and we had a lad working with us who was very good with us at doing these mechanical things and he built a radio set I remember and we were delighted with ourselves that was before you, before you bought the things I think there were only cat whisker ones or something at that stage and uh, <clears throat> I remember occasionally Tom would call me I've got Bologna on the on the, on the wireless come up at that time even and would he uh, be listening to a opera? yes we see as far back as that and that was very that was uh, as I say a time when he didn't even know where Bologna was <laughs> and neither did I only we knew vaguely in Italy type of thing but um, <clears throat> that it was all back as far as that well was he a very private man did you get to know yes. him did you know him well uh, I knew he was very he was very reserved he was very private he was a very private person even to the time uh, in his latter days if I, was, I would always ring to say I was going down because he'd be doing something he didn't like to be interrupted fair enough that sort of thing any writer or anybody like that doesn't want to be but then if I was going down I was there on the dot he was meticulous at time and you arrived when you said things like that he was a very private person and even in his latter days when he was in and out of hospital and that sort of thing uh, I went over possibly to see if he wanted anything then when he was finished telling you about that was it you left it to the next day again Elsewhere in the archives, in a programme from the music department, Tom Walsh talked about his own approach to the Wexford Festival in the early days. You must remember when we started, there was no money. What money we had was what we had in our pockets, of five or six of us. Mm. There's no backing from Arts Council or Board Forge or anything like that. I'm not suggesting there should have been, but there just wasn't. And of course, the whole social structure of the country was entirely different. It's not a question that more people now go to concerts and more people go to race meetings, more people have drinks, more people go out to dinner at night, more people go to Spain for their holidays. I mean, it's a different social structure existing. And one consequently had one to cut, very much cut one's cloth to measure. And the funny thing was that rights, if I can develop that a little, we did the Rosa Castile first year with a certain amount of uh, criticism because after all, why not Maritana, why not Bohemian Girl? So uh, having done uh, the Rose of Castile, I decided, oh, where do we go from here? And the attitude of most of the public was, now, okay, right, you've had your year, now Maritana. Now, instead of doing that, I said, no, now Lelazir de More, and in Italian. And that nearly broke us, you won't believe that. But only on the last night of four performances was the theatre full. And that theatre was full on the last night through the fact that I had luckily picked a very good young tenor who had a very fine career after a tenor called Nicola Monti. But I remember going around Wexford for the first performance and asking people, with, I went around with a very good friend of the festival, Franciscan priest Father Ender, who was here, and calling on people to say, please, will you not come to the first performance? And I must say, fair enough, they did. We had a good first performance. But there were two other performances between, and there were plenty of vacant seats. And our top prize that year was one pound, and you could get all the seats you wanted for 10 shillings. And finally, i tell you a very good story. On the very last night, 
day I came down to the theatre, first of all, it, the theatre was absolutely booked out. And I came down as a queue, mile, well, I won't say a mile, but down as far as Rose Street from the theatre, people trying to get in. How they got in, I don't know, and I probably shouldn't talk about it now with <laughs> fire regulations and the like. But anyway, most were got in. And the last two up to the box office were two men who said that they wanted. I said, look, you can't possibly get in. I said, we've come all the way from Clonmel. Now, Clonmel was a very long journey to make to Wexford in those days. Nobody was coming from America or the continent or anything, but they did come from Clonmel. I said, right, gentlemen, I said, you'll hear, but you won't see. Ten shillings each. And they got, they were delighted to get off the back, old back stairs of the they had then. And they literally just had to stand outside on that stairs. And they didn't see, but they heard. And from then on, people accepted that. Italian opera could be enjoyable and that Donizetti could be enjoyable outside Lucia de Lammermoor. Ethna Scallon worked as his assistant from 1961. She found him a meticulous and scholarly worker. One of his gifts, she said... His gift was to pick a voice suitable for that role in this theatre, in that opera. Not just a good voice. And these were notes kept as a result of travelling to various places? Yes, he went around. Uh, mainly he had agents who... He had a lot of Italian singers at the, the time that he was probably at his height around the... Six, early 60s, late 50s and he relied quite a lot on his agents to whom he would write or phone and say I want singers for the following type of roles and I'd like to have them for me on such a date and they would have their singers there. He did that more than going around to operas although he did that as well he actually auditioned individuals and had an enormous facility for remembering exactly what type of voice that was but he would keep his little handwritten notes in his book which travelled with him all the time. You acted as interpreter. He didn't speak any other language than no, English. No, he didn't. He, in spite of being such a musical person, he didn't actually have a good ear for languages and uh, he depended on other people. He conveyed his message fairly well, all right, but uh, even on the phone he would be on one side of me while I phoned Milan and he would be saying, uh, ask her how much she expects me to pay and somebody like Ada Fincy at the other end would say oh he couldn't come under so many hundred per performance and I would say this to Tom and the chin would come out and Tom would say ask her does she think we're talking about La Scala tell her that's rubbish the most we can possibly offer is such a figure and I would go back in Italian and pass this on and the whole thing would go to and fro between them and it would come down to the fact that they knew even at that time that Wexford was a shop window and the singers would come here to be spotted, even though they weren't paid a very high salary. And then you saw the singers when they came here and acted as interpreter. Yes. How did you perceive them uh, in their attitude towards him? They looked on him uh, nearly as the head of the family, in a way. He certainly, in their minds, was an impresario and they did what he expected them to do and they worked very hard here and put up with conditions they mightn't have accepted anywhere else because I think they realised the leadership, number one, the fact that he himself would work endlessly to, to get the standards that he wanted. He felt very strongly about high standards and he um, conveyed this impression to people who worked for him always, whether they were painting scenery or um, decorating the theatre or singing or whatever it was, they all got this feeling that if you're with Tom, you're with him the whole way and he wants high standards and we have to get there no matter what it costs us. And on the question of the role of the producer, Tom Walsh had very fixed views as he outlined in this interview. Production is very important. You see, it's the complete work of art, as the Germans call it. I won't try to pronounce the German, but it's the complete work of art that makes opera important. 
Now, it can be overdone. I've seen, I won't mention where, certain productions in the latter years that I would prefer not to have seen because they're really taking over from the singer. I don't think that is right. I think it's very, I think it's pointless. But in those days, of course, there was no production. Anywhere, not alone in a little place like Wexford, but in even very big theatres. To generalise, then, would you say that opera should be left as an entertainment that uh, producers attempt to uh, make no, it no, relevant? No. To well, well, when you say... Uh, I beg your pardon, sorry, now, I've cut across it too quickly. Uh, it should be left as an entertainment because... Because uh, producers nowadays attempt to, I think, point morals or uh, get across messages or... Yes, yes. Well, again, it's a matter... Again, I, I have to qualify that by saying it's, again, it's a matter of age. I saw in 76 the Patrick Sherrill ring in by Royce and loaded it. I really loaded it. As did did you, a lot of people. Did yes, you I loaded it. No, I didn't boo, but I was, I tell you, I, the booing was so horrifying. I've never in my life heard booing like it in any theatre. It was quite frightening. I can imagine. Really, really was frightening that first year. Now, I, things have probably settled down since that, and I gather some changes have been made. Now, this to me, I could not take. Historically, this to me seemed all wrong. And it's no use this statement of Wagner saying children think new. He didn't mean them to think uh, in such a in a rational fashion. I think this is irrational. Now, this, I think, also, I have to qu again qualify this by saying, this may be that I am growing old. And if you ask me about singers, I can think of singers that I heard when I was very, very young, as if I only heard them yesterday. I can think of singers I heard in the last couple of years, as if I only heard them yesterday. But there's a, quite a blank space in my life, well, I would have to think very, very hard of how did such and such an artist sing, or how, of what impression did this particular production make on me? And the thing is, this is something we must recognise that there's change going on all the time, and what may see have seemed completely over to me with this production, within say twenty years, would be complete old hat. Jim Golden was chairman of the Wexford Festival in the early nineteen sixties. This was part of his contribution to the tribute programme to Tom Walsh, broadcast during the 1989 festival. I remember him as doing absolutely everything. I mean, I wouldn't have known about the artistic thing. The operas were just an end product. But I would know that he had cast them, producers, conductors, designers. Therefore, he was artistic director. He also supervised the production manager, the technical area of it. I do know he allocated tickets himself. Therefore, he kept an eye on the box office. He, of course, had to deal with finance. I presume he had people to help him with all these things. But he would have basically had to get the money to put on the festival. He supervised the cleaning of the theatre. He saw that it was right. He gave the cleaners their instructions, what to do. So, literally, he was everything. He was in total control of the whole operation. With a lot of people helping him, but there was no question but that everything went back to Dr. Tom. And what about activity towards the opera all year round? Would Dr. Tom call meetings long before the, the season of rehearsals yeah, would start? The, the backstage workers were generally um, collected up in early September. When school started was the time that we, you know, other teachers and myself were going to it. Um, and even earlier than that, the cleaning and the preparation would have started. Then, of course, the sets were made there at that time. Most of the sets were made on the stage. And the designers would come over. Edge Woolley, who was a designer a lot that time, always painted his own sets. And I'm sure that a lot of the sets at that stage, which were mostly flats, were just made locally, again at no cost. I'd imagine from bits of timber picked up here and there and every place else, and canvas. It was mostly wooden canvas. Um, it was practically all voluntary workers then. I think there was just backstage, there would have been one stage manager and one lighting person and the rest of the people were all voluntary workers whom he controlled, to whom he was very kind, but from whom he expected complete dedication, punctuality, the job done well. The fact that you weren't being paid had absolutely nothing to do with it. It was just as if you were in a highly paid job and you had to give 100% commitment to what he wanted. What were you doing just then? At that stage, I did the props. Would you would have meant what? Have you any stories about work then? Well, doing the props then meant that you were handed a long list of objects and things to be got and you just had to produce them. There was absolutely no budget for them, so 
for your begged, your borrowed. Um, you went to somebody who could do things well with their hands and they made them for you. Um, I remember one time in Don Quixote they needed um, mandolins, four mandolins, and I got three and I had difficulty getting a fourth one. And somebody told me about a certain man who had a mandolin. So I went to him, but he had pawned the mandolin. So I redeemed it from the pawn office for 10 shillings. And when the festival was over, I said to Shane Mr. Wire, the then production manager, who of course was a local man, um, doing the job as a voluntary worker, and I said, I must bring back this mandolin to the man. And he said, you will not, you'll pawn it again for 10 shillings and give him back the ticket. But that was the type of, you know, stringent financial control. Good business and sense. Isn't a it? very, very good business sense. Did I this mean, come from Dr. Tom as well? It came from Dr. Tom, yes. That well, there was no waste and... Um, I mean, there couldn't be waste. I mean, he was doing it on terribly tight budgets and ticket prices were not enormous. And um, the finances then, as are always, must have been a headache to him. After he'd retired as full-time artistic director, Tom Walsh published a number of scholarly books on opera, as he told Andy O'Mahony in 1974. You were saying earlier that you're, you're now devoting your time to writing a great deal. And, of course, you, you've produced this book on, on opera in the 18th century... Yes, that is true. Uh, at the moment, I'm writing the history of the opera at Monte Carlo, which is a very interesting and uh, exciting story. Uh, the opera house there was founded in 1879, and I hope, God willing, to live to uh, so see the centenary and to write the history up to the centenary by 1879. Just to turn back to, to opera in Dublin in the 18th century, what struck you most about that, that particular period? And that uh, uh, there was virtually little opera in Dublin at the time, apart from a ballad opera. To me, the importance of opera in Dublin in the 18th century was that it brought a number of very good singers to Dublin. A, the only really important opera that has remained in the repertory that, has, uh, that was then sung was uh, Gluck's Orpheus. There were, of course, Handel oratorios were produced, the stage oratorios were produced here, but really there was nothing of uh, very great importance, except, again, you did have uh, quite a number of uh, the opera buffa of uh, composers like Azaniga, Piccini, uh, Paisiello, and those, but really... A opera in Dublin in the 18th century was on the whole ballad opera, English ballad opera. An appropriate cue to what opera was in Wexford in the second half of the 20th century. Rodney Milnes, editor of Opera Magazine in the Tribute Programme, gave this evaluation of Tom Walsh's choice of opera and of his achievement. We hadn't had the great Donizetti revival of the 60s and 70s, so when he did uh, Anna Bolena, for instance, that really was a step forward. And I think in those days, anyway, uh, Italian opera wasn't really considered, in quotes, respectable by the musical establishment. And I think it was quite a, a brave thing to spend the first 10, 12, 15 years of, of the Wexford Festival concentrating almost entirely on 19th century Italian opera. It must have been very refreshing. You said in your lecture that a number of Wexford operas were taken up by the major houses later on, a case in point being Mozart's uh, La Finta Giardiniera. Yes, the... absolutely. That, that was uh, an unheard of opera in those days. It was never done. Um, it did take a bit of time for the message to get through, but now you'll find it being done all over Europe. It's been even taken into the repertory of one of the, uh, the regional companies in England. Uh, it's now a sort of standard Mozart opera, which it certainly wasn't in those days. That showed the most amazing um, foresight. And another aspect of his enterprise was to present singers that weren't so well known in those days. Yes, that's something that's continued all, all the way through the festival. Um, in those early days, you hear of completely unknown singers like Janet Baker or Mirella Freni or Giacomo Aragal. Um, that was, a, again, an extraordinary foresight. It's something that all opera companies, without a lot of money, try and do, is try and find people before they're famous. And I don't think there's been any record like Wexford's to equal that. He also seems to have gone down a few byways in the, in the books he chose to write. Yes, his two-volume history of the Monte Carlo opera is, is absolutely fascinating. I mean, you just open any page and you learn something. That was a, a real labour of, of, of love and a, and a work of great scholarship. 
in your experience in the opera world, is there anybody that you've met quite like him, uh, this anaesthetist, uh, opera lover? There was no one like Dr. Tom, absolutely not. I mean, the, the vision was extraordinary. Um, I can't imagine, even in a small town like Wexford, anyone else seeing the potential, seeing the unique charm of the theatre itself and of the town and the sort of spell it would cast over people who like opera all over the world. I mean, it is a, a very international audience nowadays. Um, he thought of it, he built it up. It's, it's the most bewildering achievement. The Wexford Festival, the 50th programme just announced, opens in mid-October. This morning's programme included excerpts from original programmes by Jane Carty, Ray Lynott, Norris Davidson, Venetia O'Sullivan and Andy O'Mahony. More voices from the archives at the same time on Saturday morning next. Thank you for listening this morning and good morning. That programme was presented and produced by John Bowman.